The Law of Success, Lesson 15, Tolerance. You can do it if you believe you can. There are two significant features about intolerance, and your attention is directed to these at the beginning of this lesson. These features are, first, intolerance is a form of ignorance which must be mastered before any form of enduring success may be attained. It is the chief cause of all wars. It makes enemies in business and in the professions. It disintegrates the organized forces of society in a thousand forms and stands like a mighty giant as a barrier to the abolition of war. It dethrones reason and substitutes mob psychology in its place. Second, intolerance is the chief disintegrating force in the organized religions of the world where it plays havoc with the greatest power for good there is on this earth. By breaking up that power into small sects and denominations which spend as much effort opposing each other as they do in destroying the evils of the world. But this indictment against intolerance is general. Let's see how it affects you, the individual. It is, of course, obvious that anything which impedes the progress of civilization stands also as a barrier to each individual. And, stating it conversely, anything that beclouds the mind of the individual and retards his mental, moral, and spiritual development retards also the progress of civilization. All of which is an abstract statement of a great truth, and inasmuch as abstract statements are neither interesting nor highly informative, let us proceed to illustrate more concretely the damaging effects of intolerance. I will begin this illustration by describing an incident which I have mentioned quite freely in practically every public address that I have delivered within the past five years. But inasmuch as the cold printed page has a modifying effect which makes possible the misinterpretation of the incident here described, I believe it necessary to caution you not to read back of the lines a meaning which I had no intention of placing there. You will do yourself an injustice if you either neglect or intentionally refuse to study this illustration in the exact words and with the exact meaning which I have intended those words to convey, a meaning as clear as I know how to make the English language convey it. As you read of this incident, place yourself in my position and see if you also have not had a parallel experience, and if so, what lesson did it teach you? One day I was introduced to a young man of unusually fine appearance. His clear eye, his warm hand clasp, the tone of his voice and the splendid taste with which he was groomed marked him as a young man of the highest intellectual type. He was of the typical young American college student type, and as I ran my eyes over him, hurriedly studying his personality, as one will naturally do under such circumstances, I observed a Knights of Columbus pin on his vest. Instantly I released his hand as if it were a piece of ice. This was done so quickly that it surprised both him and me. As I excused myself and started to walk away, I glanced down at the Masonic pin that I wore on my own vest, then took another look at his Knights of Columbus pin, and wondered why a couple of trinkets such as these could dig such a deep chasm between men who know nothing of each other. All the remainder of that day I kept thinking of the incident because it bothered me. I had always taken considerable pride in the thought that I was tolerant with all men, but here was a spontaneous outburst of intolerance which proved that down in my subconscious mind existed a complex that was influencing me toward narrow-mindedness. This discovery so shocked me that I began a systematic process of psychoanalysis through which I searched into the very depths of my soul for the cause of my rudeness. I asked myself over and over again, why did you abruptly release that young man's hand and turn away from him when you knew nothing about him? Of course, the answer led me always back to that Knights of Columbus pin that he wore, but that was not a real answer, and therefore it did not satisfy me. Then I began to do some research work in the field of religion. I began to study both Catholicism and Protestantism until I had traced both back to their beginning, a line of procedure which I must confess brought me more understanding of the problems of life than I had gathered from all other sources. For one thing, it disclosed the fact that Catholicism and Protestantism differ more in form than they do in effect, that both are founded on exactly the same cause, which is Christianity. But this was by no means all, nor was it the most important of my discoveries, for my research led of necessity in many directions, and forced me into the field of biology where I learned much that I needed to know about life in general and the human being in particular. 
My research led also to the study of Darwin's hypothesis of evolution, as outlined in his Origin of Species, and this in turn led to a much wider analysis of the subject of psychology than that which I had previously made. As I began to reach out in this direction and that, for knowledge, my mind began to unfold and broaden with such alarming rapidity that I practically found it necessary to wipe the slate of what I believed to be my previously gathered knowledge, and to unlearn much that I had previously believed to be truth. Comprehend the meaning of that which I have just stated. Imagine yourself suddenly discovering that most of your philosophy of life had been built of bias and prejudice, making it necessary for you to acknowledge that, far from being a finished scholar, you were barely qualified to become an intelligent student. That was exactly the position in which I found myself with respect to many of what I believed to be sound fundamentals of life. But of all the discoveries to which this research led, none was more important than that of the relative importance of physical and social heredity. For it was this discovery that disclosed the cause for my action when I turned away from a man whom I did not know on the occasion that I have described. It was this discovery that disclosed to me how and where I acquired my views of religion, of politics, of economics, and many other equally important subjects. And I both regret and rejoice to state that I found most of my views on these subjects without support by even a reasonable hypothesis, much less sound facts or reason. I then recalled a conversation between the late Senator Robert L. Taylor and myself, in which we were discussing the subject of politics. It was a friendly discussion, as we were of the same political faith, but the senator asked me a question for which I never forgave him until I began the research to which I have referred. I see that you are a very staunch Democrat, said he, and I wonder if you know why you are. I thought of the question for a few seconds, then blurted out this reply. I am a Democrat because my father was one, of course. With a broad grin on his face, the senator then nailed me with this rejoinder. Just as I thought. Now, wouldn't you be in a bad fix if your father had been a horse thief? It was many years later, after I began the research work herein described, that I understood the real meaning of Senator Taylor's joke. Too often we hold opinions that are based upon no sounder foundation than that of what someone else believes. That you may have a detailed illustration of the far-reaching effects of one of the important principles uncovered by the incident to which I have referred, and that you may learn how and where you acquired your philosophy of life in general, that you may trace your prejudices and your biases to their original source, that you may discover, as I discovered, how largely you are the result of the training you received before you reached the age of fifteen years. I will now quote the full text of a plan which I submitted to Mr. Edward Bach's committee, the American Peace Award, for the abolition of war. This plan covers not only the most important of the principles to which I refer, but as you will observe, it shows how the lesson of organized effort, as outlined in Lesson 2 of this course, may be applied to one of the most important of the world's problems, and at the same time gives you a more comprehensive idea of how to apply this principle in the attainment of your definite chief aim.